This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Kavanaugh, thanks so much for joining us. Well, just because it is called a consent decree does not mean there will always be agreement. That was the case this week when Mayor Cantrell's staff was told to boycott a group meeting called by a federal judge to evaluate the NOPD. Discontent in the offices of law enforcement occurred again when the Orleans Parish Sheriff suddenly dismissed four key employees. If the criminal justice system seemed bumpy, nothing compares to the city streets where pothole dodging has become a skill. We will look at these stories tonight as well as new plans for the former Six Flags site and the East and the Pythian Temple, a distinguished building with a history that is troubled but surprising. Joining us tonight are Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Mike Perlstein, investigative reporter WWL-TV Channel 4, Don Ostrom, Informed Sources Future Watch reporter, and Matt Sledge, staff writer of the Times Picune, the New Orleans advocate. Matt, we're going to go on over to you because something that is really, you know, always on somebody's mind, even if they live in the city or they're just driving into the city, is how do I dodge that next pothole? So those are going to be fixed, supposedly. <laughs> supposedly, that's the key word. Um, there was a uh, meeting at the New Orleans City Council this week where New Orleans infrastructure czar Joe Threat came in and kind of gave an update on how this massive $2 billion road and water line project is going. And it, what he said will probably seem like deja vu to a lot of New Orleanians for about a couple of years now in response to these very widespread complaints about um, road work in the city. Officials have said, we're almost turning a corner, we're almost there, things are about to get way better, and he said it once again. Um, you know, there was a mix of uh, appreciation for threats, responsiveness from council members. They seem to really like him personally, mm -hmm. like how quickly he gets back to their uh, inquiries, and skepticism, I think, because of this long history. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that this whole project is supposed to fix those potholes and issues that New Orleans has had for decades, but only seems uh, in, in the minds of a lot of people to have made things worse in the, in the near term. And so the money for all of this is coming from where? It's coming <coughs> largely from FEMA. There's a little bit of city bond money in the mix too, um, but it's about $2 billion from FEMA. It's tied to Hurricane Katrina and the federal levy failures. Um, but of course, usually with FEMA money, there's an expiration date. Mm -hmm. um, it's already been pushed back once. It's very clear the city's not going to be able to get all these projects done by the latest deadline. So the city is now seeking another extension. And at the end of April, there's going to be this pretty high stakes visit from the FEMA regional administrator to kind of take a tour of some of these projects. And it will be up to FEMA to decide whether to, to extend this deadline yet again. You know, streets in New Orleans having problems is nothing new. I mean, just with our terrain here, it's yeah. it's hard to, to keep a smooth uh, a smooth surface. Um, but with this latest round of street repairs, it seems to people that there's just been no rhyme or reason where one section will be, you know, will be repaired, and then shortly after that, somebody else will come in and rip it up, or there'll be you know just chunks of areas that have been started and then left alone. Yeah. So is the strategy going to change about that? That's what officials say, and that's that's why they say we're we're finally going to turn a corner and things are going to be different. So when this program started, um, essentially, uh, contractors were working off decade-old plans. A lot of times, because these streets are so old, they would you know, find pipes yeah. from 100 years ago they didn't know about. There was terrible coordination between the city's Department of Public Works and Sewerage and Water Board. Um, and the old style of contracts the city was putting out allowed these contractors to rip up dozens or hundreds of blocks at a time without finishing them one by one. They're now moving to this new style of contract uh, where the firms are supposed to finish one block, 
before they move on to the next. Go figure, seems like common sense to a lot of people. Um, and that is supposed to be the answer to a lot of these uh, and interesting, problems. A historical note here that this money was available under the previous mayor, Mitch Landrieu. Mm -hmm. He declined it saying that we don't have the bandwidth in our Department of Public Works to handle you know, this much all at once. And that has put Mayor Cantrell up against some pretty you know, serious federal got deadlines. He fought for the money, he just didn't put the, the right. contracts out. So yeah. part of it is her race to meet these deadlines. Yes, yeah. And then another she'll, part... And she'll always say, I've been put in this corner and kind That's of right. we're doing the best we can. So, and what about the contractors? I mean, you know, the, the, are the contractors going to sort of have the fire lit under them a, a bit more? And then what do the contractors say about working with the city? Yeah, that's a very, it's a very tricky relationship. Uh, about a year ago, the contractors were saying that their relationship with the city was toxic. That was literally the word there their top lobbyists used. They seem to like Joe Threat. The new infrastructures are, they're getting payments faster. They're not always getting payments on time, they say, but there's, they say they're getting them faster. Um, at the same time, the city has said, we're trying to work harder <coughs> with them, but the city, at least rhetorically, is always saying, but we're gonna hold their feet to the fire when they, when they make life for residents unpleasant. And so there are certain areas of the city that are really targeted more than others for these repairs, right? Well, the re repairs are, are all over the place, but you know, I think the first wave of these contracts, the, one that, the ones that people, the city acknowledges weren't structured very well, were highly concentrated in, in some areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were areas of, of uptown where but the Mardi Gras blo box became a year-round phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you literally, you'd take the detour and then you couldn't <clears throat> take the next exactly. detour and you really would get yeah. stuck going miles like out a of video way. game challenge how do i get yes. out <laughs> yeah exactly. and the city says you know they've they've actually just uh kind of inked a deal with this new project management firm and they're supposed to be avoiding situations like that yeah. going forward and to be fair i had this construction on, <clears throat> on my block and talked to the foreman regularly the timetable was six months it became 18 months because of unforeseen problems underneath the ground yeah, of course they're replacing happen. sewer water drainage and when things got delayed, I asked, he goes, oh, well, we're running into some root problems with these old oak trees. Mm -hmm. And so next thing you know, a root pruning service is yeah. brought in it's a and lot delayed. Of coordination. Yeah. It's a lot. And some of our neighbors are really, really being inconvenienced. You had a story about a young um, mom who, whose water was cut off unknowingly yeah. for a couple of days. She couldn't take care of baby. She remotely in customer service. Her water was cut off. There were loud crews outside. So all of a sudden she can't work and she can't clean her baby's she bottle. She can't park. She, she has, has to, to park, park three blocks away yeah. and she's worried about carjackers on the way. It's just this I mean, cascading this is really problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's, 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 people complain of tire damage done because of the work <laughs> and they try to sue the city for it or something, that's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, I'm not your lawyer, but I wouldn't advise to bother. Right <laughs> Don't wait on oh, it. You can that's get a judgment sure. in court. You just can't collect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. All right. Thanks a lot, Matt. Okay, Mike, on over to you. Um, you know, after Mardi Gras, the, the, the Orleans Parish Sheriff was really commended for assisting and trying to get in the, the extra personnel for public safety. And then we hear about hotel rooms. Well, yes, and that was an interesting trajectory because... The sheriff, Susan Hudson, was, you know, applauded uh, almost as a hero for helping to bring the Mardi Gras parades back to their traditional routes, not only providing extra sheriff's deputies from her office, mm -hmm. but helping to recruit other agencies from throughout the region who provide, I think it was 17 other law enforcement agencies, all the way to like Little Genrette, Louisiana to bring officers and deputies and the sheriff's office went beyond that and helped coordinate their arrival and where they were staying. But then we came across documents that um, has blown up into a kind of a full-blown scandal that the, the sheriff uh, got hotel rooms for her top command, not the people actually on the parade route, the you know deputies, the top commanders who were uh, coordinating all of that uh, stayed in Hyatt Hotels, Sheraton, Marriott, um, Omni Royal Orleans, in the middle of the French Quarter, in some cases for 11 days and nights. Mm -hmm. And uh, originally there was thought that the city would reimburse, it all comes from city money, but as part of a cooperative endeavor agreement, you know, the city agreed, we're going to pay these costs, and uh, certainly for the outside agencies. But nowhere in there is anything about putting up the sheriff's deputies mm -hmm. in hotels. 
And so the, that got a red flag immediately from the city. Now, those and who came from out of, uh, not the, from the sheriff, but correct. the other smaller oh, yeah. sheriff's offices, those who came Absolutely. in from out of, you know, they, they, they had need a place to stay. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, you got to question the wisdom of people who work in New Orleans and many of whom live in New Orleans. As Joe Geruso, city councilman, said, you know, just why don't you sleep in your own bed? And they in, initially referred to the police department and look at all the rooms that they got. Well, it turns out the police department and OPD got zero for <laughs> its officers. So poke a hole in that argument. And now, um, there were a couple of in, in, uh, who, uh, the, the CFO and then also the council, who basically advised the sheriff, right. we can't do this. We can't spend <laughs> public well, that, money that was, on this. Uh, part two. As the sheriff was defending the expense and, you know, these deputies worked for very long hours, needed the accommodation, didn't want to drive home. And some of them, you know, live outside the parish. But it turns out that even before the first room was booked, the CFO, David Troutenberg, uh, issued an email saying sheriff's employees um, do not qualify for rooms. And he got overruled. Um, and the rooms were, were rented, Look, and it, you know. The, there but was general also, count, the council, Graham Bosworth, said he backed up the CFO. Saying, well, so oh, he sure. came in to the debate afterward when there was questions about would the city reimburse, and he said, mm -hmm. "Well, I looked at the CEA pretty airtight legal document. Said, no, we're outside of the 35 miles, and we're not an, you know, outside law enforcement agency, and it just kind of went from." bad to worse because there was infighting and it turns out I was able to get my hands on some emails that were somewhat blistering between her, her top staff, some of whom supported getting the rooms and stayed in the rooms. Graham Bosworth, you know, just trying to make sure the sheriff stayed legal and David mm -hmm. Trautenberg, the CFO, right. uh, warned against it in the first place and say this could be a real problem. Now in the midst of that, questions have been raised about who actually stayed in those rooms, and that remains part of an investigation that Troutenberg started, but he didn't get to complete because the most recent news late last week was four of the people at the center of that all got canned by the sheriff. Now, the way she put it was they were given the offer to resign, get fired, or potentially like stay on for up to 30 days. Which one of the four is doing. Yeah. Right, so Kristen Morales, she was uh, assistant sheriff over IT and in internal affairs. She's staying for the 30 day transition. Troutenberg has already attired an employment attorney, threatened a whistleblower <laughs> wrongful termination lawsuit. So what started with a lot of applause for the sheriff right. has now turned into a scandal that's even you know, gotten to the city council and, you know, with, with questions so, of their own. A, a more questions uh, certainly that need to be answered, but also we should say that the sheriff said that this decision regarding her staff, the shakeup, was something that she was thinking of way before this. Before she the, did say that, and of course those who <laughs> were on the receiving end of the pink slips refute that in a variety of ways. They had many projects like in the pipeline, they were in good standing up until this blow up. And then just one added twist because New Orleans being New Orleans, a scandal can't just be, you know, one note, but uh, a symphony of oddness that within hours of the sheriff uh, defending this expense and even if the city can't pay for it, hey, my deputies were working these long hours. Next thing you know, that same day, she announced the donation right. from this Vermilion Parish dog training, police dog training company had donated the 19 plus thousand dollars to cover the hotel expenses. That seems so, really fishy. Yeah, that has a huge question mark. You're such a cynic. <laughs> Trottenberg started investing that part of it. Of course, that will go, you know, okay. incomplete because he's now gone. So we continue to look for answers to this. There should thing. be more stories okay, where Mike. this came from. All right, thanks a lot, Don. Over to you. Six Flags, we heard this week about some plans for the former Six Flags site from the new developers. There are plans. We're looking at almost 18 years since Katrina rolled through and yeah. knocked out Six Flags. And, and we've seen lots of iterations about what it could be, would be, might be. The latest is Bayou Phoenix. I think everybody's heard that name. And their plan they presented to neighbors this week. Um, it's a water park resort with hotels totaling 400 rooms, a sports 
park complex with 30 acres of outdoor fields and 185,000 square feet of indoor facilities for volleyball and basketball and training, go-karts, mini, mini golf, arcade, that sort of, really a family-friendly area in New Orleans East. Um, the lease with the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority has yet to be signed. Financing isn't lined up. Tenants aren't lined up. Once that lease is signed and then a master plan is approved by NORA, the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority, they have a year to kind of get their ducks in a row and can't make changes to the master plan and start building. So the ball is rolling in that direction. We'll see if the ball actually makes any movement. I can tell you those kind of sports complexes are huge. I, as a parent of athletes, have been in Hammond a lot at the Chapapila Sports Complex, mm -hmm. which is dozens of soccer and baseball fields and football fields. And uh, the last statistics I could find for them were 2016, where their fields brought in an estimated spending of $9 million mm -hmm. in a little tiny section of Hammond with hotels and restaurants that pop up around them. So economic development leaders say if Bayou Phoenix goes according to plan and if Propel Park, which is an industrial and warehouse commercial, excuse me, commercial development area in the Michoud area, if that takes off, you really will see both of those things as catalysts for the East as a whole. Right now, the business in New Orleans East is strictly serving the residents there, dining and, and groceries and that sort of thing, or NASA Michoud. There's, there's nothing else. There's nothing that's going to contribute to the development of parks and schools and better neighborhoods and, yeah. and more people coming in. These two things working simultaneously really could do that. So that Propel Park, for those who don't remember, it's, um, it's one, million dollar, one million square feet of office and warehouse space that's kind of connected to NASA Michoud. It's a long-term lease with NASA. NASA. It uh, is being developed by a Los Angeles-based group. There's a, a tenant already, Te Textron Services. Mm -hmm. They should be in there by the end of the year. So it, Blade Dynamics is out in that part of the east as well. They're making the wind turbine blades for, for wind energy. There's a lot moving in the right direction, mm -hmm. but there are some real downsides to New Orleans East, whether they're perceived or real. Um, that's the good question. There's there's the issue of crime that people think about. Um, citywide, there's that issue. Mm -hmm. There's also environmental issues yeah. with whether or not there are wetlands that need help and need to be filled, and then you need to go through the government to make that happen. Um, so it's it's a long timeline. We've heard you know, Drew Brees was originally interested right. in doing something out there. That plan fizzled. This is Troy Henry's plan. Um, We'll see. The neighbors are really behind it and very excited about it. City leaders are excited about it. But I kind of feel like we've been there and we've felt that excitement before and we haven't seen anything come to fruition. So only yeah. time will tell at this point. So the point. developers have said that they really sort of followed what the neighbors had recommended. Yes. And, and sort of doing what they wanted. So we'll see where it goes. It wasn't the fact that Jazzland, which later became Six Flags, Mm -hmm. wasn't as successful as originally projected because of the location. Because of the location and the, the proximity between the French Quarter and the downtown area, it, it's not all that close. There's not good transportation really between the two. There's a lot of traffic going over the high rise to get to and fro. So we'll have to see if there, it's a something that can take off and yep. maybe be a more regional draw, not just a downtown draw. Right. Um, with those sports facilities there in addition to the park, you will have families there. So, even, even from the Slide L and the St. Tammany and you know, you could draw some of those people, but there's that right. six mile bridge. Exactly. I mean, the there, bridge you've got bridges side. in both sides. I yeah. mean, there are a lot of downsides that they're going to have to climb over those hurdles. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Don. All right, Mike, over to you. Let's touch on also what happened, the, the mayor and the, the police consent decree. Let you take it from there. Well, right. We've been under, uh, the police department has been under a right. consent decree since 2012, so it's 11 years and counting. And where just maybe two years ago, there was some hope that the consent decree might be winding down. It looks like now we're moving uh, in the wrong direction. And the most recent indicator of that was the cancellation of a sort of a public forum related to the consent mm -hmm. decree. Uh, public was going to be invited over at Loyola University. Um, the mayor sent notice that she was prohibiting city employees from participating. And, talking about it, her reasoning was that the topics on that agenda weren't a explicit part of the consent decree. 
And that seemed to throw some cold water on the process of moving this thing forward. And How did the judge respond? Well, the judge, uh, she did not, <laughs> you know, her, her words were measured, but she did say that a big part of the consent decree is transparency and taking away this opportunity for public interface about the issues facing the police department, um, you know, certainly doesn't fit transparency. So it looks like a big step backwards. And I know Matt has covered this uh, closely yeah, well, as the, well. Yeah, then the next shoe to drop was the day after that back and forth between the judge and the mayor. The mayor held a news conference where she accused the judge and the monitors of political bias. Um, and she was asked about a comment that the lead monitor made about Jeffrey Vappi, a member of her, her security detail. Um, and the lead monitor said he had blocked Officer Vappi's uh, return to her security detail. And, you know, the mayor was asked about that, and she repeated these allegations of, of political bias. So this is something that the mayor has really been crusading for, as we should oh, say, look. Uh, to get from <clears throat> under this consent decree. But it's not her choice. It's going to be the, the Fed's choice, right? And, and there, there could be, and, and in terms of not appearing before, you know, the city right. employees, not appearing before a public hearing, what about court? Well, because court, there are court you're compelled. Too, right? It's a, you know, court order uh, compelled by a federal judge overseeing this consent decree, in this case, Judge Susie Morgan. Um, what is interesting, and you know, we like to say in shorthand, it's easy to get into a federal consent decree, but very hard to get out of one. This was entered into voluntarily under the previous mayor, Mitch Landrieu, mm -hmm. uh, because of some long-standing problems in the police department, and, and everyone seems to universally acknowledge that. The police department has made major strides, and just when it looks like the police department is close to the finish line, they would say that the goalposts keep moving and mm -hmm. it seems to get further away and the expense, especially with a department that's dwindling and the number of officers, uh, it's become a real hardship. And so the, this mayor has now taken a, a, quite a turn. She has filed a motion to end the consent decree that was rejected by the judge. She went to Washington to lobby the Department of Justice. That was rejected. So. It doesn't look like there's any end in sight, and in fact, the latest from the monitors is that there seems to have been some backsliding by the department. So if there is a, a, a court hearing held, which undoubtedly there will be at some point, what, what are city employees to do if they're asked to appear? Well, once again, you could go to the mayor's comments that she wasn't going to allow this public forum because it didn't deal with issues specifically spelled out in the mm -hmm. consent decree, and especially the ones and it's a pretty few in number that where the monitors have determined the NOPD not in compliance. Um, but those areas that are still, you know, the subject of improvements, certainly I would imagine she's going to allow police department, police officials. And if she does it, if she forbids, you know, cops from showing up for a hearing on something that's clearly covered by the consent decree, that would be a major escalation. That would put us in... Oh. in in I mean, that could lead different to a, territory. That could lead to a contempt of court yeah, exactly. by a federal right. judge. It could, but or at the very least, continue to delay getting out of this right. consent decree. Okay, well, but that hasn't happened yet, so we'll see where it goes. Their allies will be very closely watching that next court hearing right. on this. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. E, over to you. The Pythian Temple downtown. This is an interesting story. This is this building on Loyola Avenue, pretty much across the street from the library. It was, Cross Street kind of catty corner to it. For a long time, it was known as the Saratoga Building. A lot of people would uh, would know it by name because that street used to be called Saratoga Street. Uh, it was uh, built like in, in 1910. And the story behind it is really interesting because after the Civil War, there was a lot of movement. People wanted to do things. And there was a group that thought it sort of an imitation of the Masons started in Washington. It was called the Pythians. And they tried to do the same thing that the Masons did, sort of like this exclusive men's service organization. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things were big just all around the world. So you had the Pythians. Well, as they started, and, and the, the membership of it was all white, and inevitably there were some blacks who wanted to get in, and they couldn't. And, and so somebody started another Pythians group. They called it like the, the North American Pythian, Pythians Organization which is pretty much a black organization. This went to court, and the courts allowed it. And so you, you had what in popular literature was referred to as the white Pythians and the colored Pythians. Well, the latter became really popular throughout the South, 
And in several places, there were these buildings built, these temples. And there was a guy in New Orleans whose name was Green, Smith Green. And the story is that, uh, that he was born into slavery, grew up, became a millionaire through banking and investments, but a really wealthy man. And he became the Louisiana head of the Black Pythians. And he was the guy behind building this building. And the building was just hailed throughout the nation, especially in black news media, as a wonderful example of the potential of, uh, you know, black investments and development sort of thing. And so it was very much an admired building in its heyday. It, it had a lot of offices, a lot of companies and things. And so it was very much admired. As time passed, and uh, I guess with integration, and you didn't need things that were all black and all white or all things, that uh, it, it kind of lost its importance and became more of an abandoned building. A couple of years ago, these people had this great idea. Let's buy the building, uh, put part of it into low-income rental units, mm -hmm. and at the bottom have a marketplace. And that's like a great idea. This was a post-Katrina idea, bring people into the neighborhood. It never worked. Uh, the marketplace never worked. And uh, Stephanie Regal reported a few weeks ago that the, the owners were contacting the people in there saying, you know, essentially we can't hold on with this deal. We have to... We have to change, and so there's really concern about where that's going. But an interesting part of the story is on top of that building was this famous roof garden. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of performances there, a lot of the jazz musicians uh, came in there. In one year, I think of like 1909, there was this group in the neighborhood. It was a group of black men who were workers, but they were friends, and they formed their group called the Tramps, and the Tramps would do things. And one night, the Tramps went to an entertainment there. It was a vaudeville show. Uh, uh, and the name of the play was There Never Was and Never Will Be a King Like Me. And then at Vaudeville Show, there was a character named Zulu. Okay, and he said, hey, that's an idea. Why don't we start an organization mm -hmm. and call it Zulu? So essentially the whole Zulu idea um, started there. So part of it's not sure what the future is, but people need to right. be aware of what the past was. And thanks, a great, great story about that. And now real quick, other stories. We have to go fast. Okay, the uh, legislature goes into session April 10th. Uh, goes until June 5th. Uh, it's one of these general sessions, so they're expecting one of the things. A fast start will be Alonzo Knox, who was elected last week oh, right. from District 93, and now he's going into the it's session. Right into it. Okay, Mike, over to you real quick. Well, we talked a lot about the NOPD consent decree. Well, the sheriff's office is under consent, federal consent decree because of the jail right. conditions, sure. and the recent controversy there could affect getting out of that consent decree. We'll okay. have to see. All right, Don? All right, at UNO Lakefront Arena area this weekend, 15th an annual Hogs for the Cause, which is one of the largest fundraisers for pediatric pediatric brain cancer research. All right. So get on out there and eat. This weekend. Okay, Matt. Uh, two bills filed at the legislature would change some of the recall laws, so we'll be tracking those. All right. All right, guys, thanks so much. Great discussion. Thank you all for joining us, too. See you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.